Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. I hope you're doing well. Before we begin the session, let me introduce myself. My name is Elika. I'm working as project manager of Insight Speaker Series at Recap. It is my pleasure to welcome you today as the host in this webinar session, talking about data analytics, how business decision making has changed with technology and data. I'm excited because later we will introduce our inspiring speaker and moderator. For now, I would like to say thank you to our partners, 1000 Startup Digital and ICT Ministry of Indonesia as our strategic partners, Kumpul as our community partner, Zillion as our media partner, and also Salaksa as our event partner. This project will not be able to run without our partner support. We are very delighted to have you in here in Tech Speaker Series, which will be held bi-weekly with several topics around business, finance, marketing, and technology. As our current situation affected by COVID-19, many businesses and startups have been adjusting and maintain their business both in short and long-term action to survive this situation. That is the reason this webinar series is made, to help the government to support startups and business to survive and thrive in COVID-19 situation. The knowledge and experience will be delivered by international speakers and moderators from top-notch companies to share their perspective in business. Today, in this session, we will learn about data analytics and how it affects business decision-making. Before we start, I'm going to explain the agenda for today. So after participant check-in, we have opening and introduction as what we already have now. After that, we're going to have talk show from Evan Tan, our speaker. He is chief of staff at Holistic Software. And then we're going to have Q&A session, which will be facilitated by our moderator, Araya Nunhutasuan. If you have any question regarding our topic during the talk show, you don't have to wait until the end of the talk show. You can just write it on Q&A chat box in Zoom, and then we will go through with it later on Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's session. She is the co-founder and CFO of Snapcard a startup specializing in collecting offline data to enable real-time shopper engagement through machine learning capability. In her role, she is responsible for finance, fundraising, business strategy, and backbone operation. Prior to Snapcard, she has more than seven years experience in investment banking and venture capital. She is Arara Nunhutasuan. Thank you for sparing your time to be able to facilitate our discussion today. Hi, thank you, Eric, um, Elika. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for having me here today. I'm very excited to be here. Um, my name is Araya, and I'm currently the co-founder and CFO of Snapcart. So maybe a little bit about Snapcart. Um, so data analytics is actually what we do as well, but we focus more on the collection. So our vision is to make offline data available and useful. We specialize in collecting unstructured offline data, which is from receipts, and turn them into actionable data points for brands. Um, we collect millions and millions of receipts to date from shoppers to understand more about their purchasing behavior and in enable brands to connect directly via our app. You can learn more about Snapcart and what we do at snapcart.global. So about today's topic, right? How business decision making has changed with technology and data. This topic cannot be any more relevant in today's world. Any companies, I guess, as you guys all know, that's why you're in this webinar in the first place, um, any companies that are still making decisions without actual data will ultimately fall behind their competitors. Actually, that's why we built Snapcard in the first place, because we know that the availability of offline data is not available anywhere except for surveys and market research. So we want, to, we want it to collect extremely valuable but very messy offline consumer data to help the companies to make better decisions. So what we do is only part of the equation though, collecting raw data and processing them into valuable data points. But what is also very extremely important is how to merge tons of data sources and generate insights really quickly with the right infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and tools like Holistic. And um, that brings me to introduce Evan today um, Evan Tan, he is the Chief of Staff at Holistic Software, 
It is a full stack data analytics platform ranked number two globally by Gartner's front runners for usability in 2018 and 2019. Having worked with many startups, making a difference through building great products and using data, Evan is evangelizing how data can build and help builders and action takers operationalize their visions to do meaningful work and create meaningful careers. So I'm gonna pass the stage to Evan Tan. Okay, sure. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Noon. And it's great to see everyone here today. Uh, just checking that everyone can see me clearly. Everything's all right? Okay. All right, so thanks very much for uh, joining this session today. And what I'll be sharing about is about basically how business decision making uh, has changed with um, the developments in technology and data. And just to give a quick introduction uh, of myself, my name's Evan. I'm the chief of staff at Holistic Software. I joined Holistic about uh, three years ago as a growth hacker, and now I'm their chief of staff. And so basically, this has been um, quite a uh, transformative experience. I consider myself um, a self-taught coder as well as a data evangelist, uh, because now basically, uh, based on what we're building at Holistic, we've actually seen some really important uh, developments in the industry about where data analytics is headed towards. And that's basically what I'll be sharing about today, uh, about how these changes are actually really significant in terms of how we can think about uh, what this means for businesses. And to introduce a bit more about holistics, which uh, our, uh, Noon already did a great job of uh, sharing. Basically, we're a company that is spread across uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia, and we service more than um, you know 150 over customers in more than 20 countries across the United States, Europe, and Asia as well. And we're a team of more than uh, 30 people uh, that basically was first founded by uh, uh, three co-founders: our CEO Vincent, their CTO Kui, and the chief engineer Tan. And that's actually um, the origins of the company back in 2015. And we service quite a few. Uh, customers, um, unicorns, as well as other startups, as well as other uh, companies of sizes, big and small. And it really goes to show that with analytics, it really is, uh, it's not necessarily something only for big companies, it's actually relevant for even young startups, uh, that as long as they have that data-driven uh, culture in them. And we are also a software that's been um, ranked second in the world in terms of software usability by the Gartner Frontrunner uh, report in 2019, uh, as 2018, 2019, and also as a, a top tool for data analysis uh, in 2020. And this actually outperforms some names that some of you might be more familiar with in terms of data analytics tools. And I'll be sharing a bit more about how we can think about these different tools and the landscape, because really, I think a very key thing to keep in mind is that uh, there's going to be a lot of different technologies, a lot of different tools, but what are some of the principles that stay constant? Because data analytics has actually been around for more than 50 years. Business intelligence is not a new industry. People talk about it as though it's something that's uh, modern and uh, you know, sexy as well, but really it's actually been around for a long time. And there's actually been some important developments along those lines as well that I'll be sharing about. I, I think it's uh, safe to say that everyone can agree <laughs> that it's a digital world that we're living in uh, in this day and age. And an interesting point as well is, uh, especially what's, with what's going on in the world, when people are talking about what were some of the triggers for digital transformation in companies, it wasn't the CEO, it wasn't the CTO, it was actually COVID. The changing situation made people realize how important it is to actually have uh, a a game plan when it, came, when it comes to working with software, with technology, with data. All right, just, just checking that uh, everything's clear. Um, uh, is my voice clear? Everything's all right so far? Okay, perfect. So something to keep in mind uh, about some of these changes. Think about from the moment you first woke up, what was the first thing you did? I think if you're like me and many other people, you probably reached for your smartphone first. And that's actually the reality of what's, uh, of what's happened in the world now. Think about tools like um, Netflix, think about Amazon Prime, think about how logistics and shipping has changed. Uh, basically, we live and breathe uh, on technology and data in this day and age, and actually it powers a lot of the things that we're doing. 
And there was actually a really interesting talk that was given by um, the A16Z team and Jason Horowitz team talking about how the nature of decision making has actually fundamentally changed uh, with all these developments. And basically what uh, you can actually have a look at the QR code at the bottom right if you're interested to uh, watch this talk. But the idea here really is that nature of decision making has become much more decentralized. Uh, in the past, maybe it was just the top management that would be making decisions for a company. But now, because of data and because of technology, the ability to make decisions has to be at every level. It has to be uh, at the middle management, at the level of the people on the ground, the people are working in customer service and sales and marketing operations. And that ability has actually fundamentally changed uh, the fabric of how companies operate. So the interesting thing here is this, technology is improved, data is growing at an exponential volume, but the nature of decision-making has not evolved to keep pace with these changes. And this is something that um, I think for those of you uh, who maybe have worked in large companies uh, know that actually it's really difficult to get people to be aligned on the same page. Different departments have different agendas, they have different ways of making decisions, and basically people start working in silos. And this actually isn't even a problem just for large companies, it can even happen at small companies. People end up in silos and perhaps maybe uh, the sales team has a certain way of defining certain metrics around how to calculate revenue. And uh, maybe the marketing team has a different idea. And these differences can result in a lack of alignment in companies, which makes it very hard for people to move towards the same goals because everyone has their own agendas and they can't agree. And these silos really uh, kind of creates a, a pernicious effect for people uh, in the organization. Because basically with these silos, if people keep coming up against these barriers, they sort of pick up a behavior of what you can call, say, learned helplessness. You feel like your actions have no impact, so you stop trying. But uh, what I'm going to share is that actually this sort of learned helplessness could be a symptom of how the systems are designed rather than anything else, really, that's uh, the issue. So this framework that I'm um, sharing with you is actually, if you think about it, um, it becomes quite obvious that actually the cycle between people, process, and technology uh, is something that really impacts how people function in a company and how business decision-making changes because of this. So think about it this way. The first group of people that start the company have a certain set of skills and a certain set of ideas, which actually informs how they think about technology and software. And based on that thinking, they make certain decisions. Uh, and, and this decisions about software and technology, I'll give you a very simple example. Think about how um, maybe in the past, people used to send Word documents or Excel files to each other, and it was very hard to track versions because they would just keep trying to send the latest version uh, to update, and sometimes it gets lost and communication problems occur. But now that changed with things like Google Sheets and Google Docs, where everyone's working on the cloud on the same version of the latest document. Or even think about um, storage services, how in the past people had to use floppy disk and USB uh, sticks to be able to pass files to each other. But now with uh, services like Dropbox and Google Drive, everything's in the cloud, everyone can work and access the same files. So this is just a simple example of basically how the tools that you use actually have real impacts on the kind of work that you do. So this cycle actually then actually informs uh, the kind of people that you need in your team, the kind of people that you hire. You hire people with certain skill sets, maybe they know how to use certain pieces of software, or maybe they understand how to architect a system. And then this cycle kind of reinforces itself. So this is something to keep in mind that actually a lot of this is um, what some people will call path dependency. The choices of people in the past impact what is possible in the future. And so what I want to introduce is this idea that actually when it comes to designing modern organizations, some of the key things that are now possible is the ability to work with alignment and autonomy. Let me just put this here out of the way. Yeah, so one of the key things to think about, um, this is actually a framework that is used at Spotify. And what they share is the idea that the best kinds of uh, organizations are the ones that work with a high alignment and high autonomy. And basically what this means is that you're actually giving people the ability to make 
the best decisions. Because think about it, when you hire your staff, you're not necessarily hiring them to tell them what to do because you want them to solve the problems that you have. You want to hire your staff to tell you what to do about how you can fix uh, problems and solutions. And if you're always telling them what to do, then maybe something has uh, gone wrong in the way things are structured and set up. And this is the key ideas around alignment and autonomy. How do you actually structure your decision making and leadership structure in a company to ensure that people are actually realizing their full creative potential. They are fully applying themselves in their workplace. They're actually using uh, all their capabilities to figure out how to tackle the same goals uh, that you have as maybe the management of the company to get to where you want to be versus uh, a high alignment, a low autonomy situation where it's top down or maybe uh, <laughs> low alignment and high autonomy where you're not quite sure what everyone's doing. So on this point about how decision making can be improved with high alignment and high autonomy, our belief, or at least my belief, is that this is actually powered by data. And this is something you can think about how in this day and age, um, the way that data decisions are being made for sales, for customer service, for marketing, very importantly for product, a lot of companies are already operating in this space. Think about how Netflix is able to make uh, recommendations to you about what you would most likely want to watch. Uh, this idea that actually decision making is actually not even just about giving charts and visualizations to people to make better decisions, it's about fully automating the process of even making decisions. And this is basically the idea that I'm sharing here that a lot of times, a lot of um, people that we've worked with, and also I'm sure if you look in uh, for examples online of how data has actually transformed the way companies work. Uh, we've seen examples of people that have been able to greatly reduce business hours. Uh, somebody that used to have to be on call 24 seven uh, to be able to support the team was then able to uh, basically create uh, an interface for people to access the data themselves without having to be the bottleneck. Or for example, they were able to automate reports via Slack, via email to reach the rest of their team to be able to support um, their operations. Or maybe even companies that are in the mental health space, they were actually able to use the product data to better inform how they can support some of uh, their users and millions of users even. And also the idea of being able to explore uh, your data in 360 degrees views of your users and your customers to be able to uh, support them. Or even, for example, let's say there's a flash sale, you realize it's a public holiday and you see that in the data, how can you respond? Or even automate triggers to be able to respond to changes in the data. So these are things that all become possible uh, when you actually have uh, the right sort of systems in place. So based off what I've just shared, right? the old world where basically we have a situation where there's so much data that's being generated that people can't quite uh, manage it versus the new where you have a new framework for how you can approach decision making. Something, uh, two quotes that I really enjoy uh, about how to think about data. Uh, one says that if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have opinions, let's just go in mind. Uh, that's actually a pretty good example of how without the right information, uh, then it just becomes a war of op opinions. And in that case, uh, sometimes maybe it makes sense to just let uh, what they call the hippo syndrome, the highest paid person in a room to make the decisions there uh, versus the new world where if you have access to data and you decentralize decision making, then even, uh, you know, somebody that's just um, maybe a junior employee is able to challenge the management and say, look, this is what the data is able to point out. I've observed an interesting behavior in how things, uh, how maybe our sales are performing or maybe how uh, people are responding to our marketing campaigns. And with that, then everyone is actually, it becomes a more democratic approach. You're able to anchor your decisions on the reality of things. And also this other example of how, if you tell me how you will measure me, I'll tell you how I will behave. <laughs> so it's actually a very interesting thing that when it comes to data, it kind of becomes part and parcel of how humans behave and um, how basically if you set up the wrong KPIs, you set up the wrong measures, you could actually be incentivizing people to behave in ways that you do not want. So this is actually part of how you should uh, also think about how you can design a system effectively. So ultimately what I would challenge uh, people to think about is that when people think data, they think it's something really uh, techy, something that's very uh, basically just bells and whistles and flashing lights. But really what I think 
the main point of data really is, it's about transforming uh, decision-making cultures in organizations. It's about what is the essence of your company? How do you make decisions? How do you operate? How do you listen to each other? How do you decide what's the best course of action? Because if you think about what a company is, effectively, it's a group of people getting together, applying their skills to reach a common objective, uh, depending on what objective it is that you set. So how do you make sure that as you have more people in the organization, that you're still pointing in the same direction, still working towards the same uh, place, uh, whether you are aligned? And this really comes with how your uh, culture operates. And I would argue that that culture is very much driven by uh, access to data. Uh, a really interesting piece of advice that Brian Chesky, the founder of Airbnb, was given uh, was that the investor told him, don't mess up the culture. That's the most important thing that you have to do as a founder. And what we've observed working with companies who are uh, adopting data analytics is that, interestingly, it's a very similar curve or a very similar process that a lot of companies go through when it comes to data adoption. And it's that process of that cycle that you saw on the previous slide. And it's actually a behavior that's learned. Basically, maybe there was a, originally a data champion that was pushing things internally. And then the question was, were they able to create some access to data capabilities? Were they able to improve the way people did things? And by that process of providing such capabilities, did people become uh, able to make better decisions, be able to produce some better results, and then everyone starts buying into the idea that, yes, let's get more data-driven processes. Let's use this as a way of making sure that we are building the company in the right way and we're uh, achieving the results that we want. So it becomes a virtuous cycle, uh, but getting to that virtuous cycle is the challenge and also the topic of what we're discussing today. So to the topic of the talk about how we can actually improve business decision making through the application of data, it's useful to try to understand what are some of the key concepts and principles around how do you set up analytics uh, for businesses. And our team actually published an analytics guidebook recently, and you can actually access it using the QR code at the bottom right. And what we did was actually we condensed a lot of the learnings that we had working with different customers by our observations of what's going on in the industry to be able to provide a condensed version of what are some of these high level principles that we see, even the history of how analytics has got into where it is today. And although um, the targeted um, intended audience for the talk was really uh, people like product managers, data analysts, founders of companies and startups. Um, I, and I think today there are a lot of people who are actually still in university. I think it's actually quite useful uh, to try to wrap your head around some of these ideas that I'll be sharing today and are explained in more detail in the guidebook. Because really, um, I would challenge that it doesn't make sense to keep learning too many tools. It's more important to understand the standards and how things actually work and come together. So, uh, uh, I'll caution against um, trying to master uh, a certain software and thinking that's going to set you up well for a job. Actually, what's more important is how you can understand how things relate to each other. Yeah, so some of the key things I'm going to share um, about some of the views that we have is around ideas about uh, things like ETL or ELT, extract transform load versus extract load transform. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about these different points here, but something that I think is quite interesting for, um, especially for students, uh, something to keep in mind is that in data analytics, especially for a data analyst role, people hear a lot about Python, hear a lot about R, but really probably the most important skill is actually SQL. And for some reason or another, not all institutions emphasize this point. But really, when it comes to working with databases, especially relational databases and data warehouses, the industry standard is actually SQL. So that is something that I would suggest that uh, people should look into in more detail if they're interested in the space of analytics and how to actually uh, work with data, That, especially when it comes to working with data. Uh, if you think about how any app that you're using on a phone um, has a database sitting behind somewhere that is actually going into, you know, when you key in your user details, they probably have a user table sitting in a database somewhere. How do you work with that data? The skill for working with the data is more often than not SQL. So again, what I want to point out is um, I'm going to share a pretty uh, controversial opinion. 
And my belief is that we will never be able to train enough data professionals to meet the needs of industry and companies. And what I mean by this is that people that have worked in a startup will understand how challenging it is to hire. And if you think about um, some of the reports by recruitment companies talking about some of the gaps about, say, skills for data analysts, data scientists, data engineering, the reality of the situation is that the skills that are necessary are evolving at such a quick pace that what you thought was uh, required when you first joined, the picture of what's required after a while could shift very quickly. So the role of data analyst at one company could be very different to another, even though the titles are exactly identical, they're both data analysts. And this is a field that's evolving very quickly. And what that means is really that understanding the technologies behind it, understanding the tools might actually become more essential because um, just a simple example of how uh, in the past, uh, data engineers used to be very critical in the process of loading data into a data warehouse. And that was in a very old school world of um, basically the extract, transform, load process into these million dollar data warehouses. So the priority was on data engineers. But then what happened is that with new cloud tools that were developed, with things like AWS providing cloud services, which then enabled startups to grow, and providing services like Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, Snowflake, Microsoft Azure, these data warehouse technologies changed what was actually the cost structure of and the processes of how people work with data, which meant that the data analysts became more important in these with these developments. So then that means that basically software has actually taken over the roles that were relevant in just a few years ago. So these kind of changes actually have big implications on how you should de uh, develop a career in data analytics. And this is something to think about as well, how the interplay between technology, software, and your skill sets could actually be affecting the end result. So something to keep in mind here, when people think about data, they think maybe charts and um, visualizations or data science and machine learning. But the reality is that's actually the surface of what uh, is important when it comes to working and dealing with data. That's really the 20% of the issue. The 80% of the issue really is what's below uh, the water, the rest of the iceberg, which is how do you structure your data? How do you prepare the data? How do you make sure that the data is loaded, it's cleaned, it's transformed, it's able to be worked with? So if your skills are only focusing on the top 20% uh, top of what is needed, you might be missing a very big chunk of what would make you more effective uh, in your role of working with data. And I would argue that over time, it's gonna be more important that it's not enough to just learn how to build visualizations. You're going to need to understand how do I actually load data into a data warehouse, for example? How do I structure and transform it? And that's what would make you a more developed and uh, complete data professional. So again, back to that uh, diagram I showed about why choices of um, you know, how people and process affects the choices of software. Something I wanna explain is, um, it's a sort of a concept that I, I've borrowed from software engineering. And uh, it's an interesting analogy that I find useful to think about how this actually affects uh, teams that are being structured and companies. So basically what this diagram is showing here is that these are uh, what you could call functions that are uh, not as efficient, and these are functions that are more efficient as you move from top to bottom here. And big O notation is basically a way of describing uh, how, how a function or algorithm scales over time and how its, uh, its performance works. And if you think about it in terms of people, let's say on this curve, the assumption is if you add additional person, they're able to complete uh, one more unit of work. So if I add more one, add another person, uh, they're able to do a bit more work. And so if I just keep hiring, then ideally, uh, then things would actually mean that I can uh, grow faster. But that's not necessarily the case, depending on how your company is structured, how your system was designed. It could well be that maybe the way you've set things up is that each additional uh, staff actually adds more complexity to your organization, maybe you have to train them, maybe you have to explain how to the existing systems work, or maybe the way uh, the departments are working are so convoluted that actually ends up slowing down the progress of the company. 
versus a situation where you have a function that is so uh, well designed that actually each additional person that's hired actually doesn't affect uh, the efficiency and in fact, uh, maybe increases the efficiency. Maybe each person is able to do three units of work as a simplification. So the idea here really is that how you design your business actually really impacts what is possible and how you scale. Have you built your company in a way that allows extra people that join to be more effective or have you designed it in a way that the additional person that joins becomes a drag on how your company will scale and how effective it can be. So why this matters when it comes to thinking about data is that's exactly what has happened in analytics. So there was actually a development in the software world uh, called DevOps, which was actually how uh, basically two key departments, the uh, the developers, the people who like to build things, and the operations teams uh, when it came to IT operations, the people who are in charge of um, making sure the server is running, everything is operating well, basically they were working in very siloed ways. And this actually really slowed down what was possible uh, for software companies. This was um, you know, in the recent decades. And basically what happened with DevOps was that they realized that there has to be a better way of structuring how we're working together and so they developed systems that actually basically allowed uh, this process of what they call continuous integration, continuous development, where you actually decouple the problem. So instead of making it such that developers and operation teams were working in silos, they managed to get on the same page and actually break up the issue, which became something like, um, you can think of AWS, Amazon Web Services, the fact that they were able to provide uh, IT architecture uh, in the cloud. So that means that now companies can just put down a credit card and be able to purchase um, the technology they need to be able to build their companies. Whereas previously in the past, people would actually need to invest in hardware, the capital needed to start a business was so high. But because of this decoupling, because of the DevOps movement, this actually enabled uh, startups to even emerge in the first place because of companies like Amazon Web Services that then allow people to access uh, these uh, services online in the cloud uh, with just nothing more than a credit card. And something similar has happened in the data space. So basically what I'm about to share is that the process of how data professionals work together, data engineers, data analysts, even data scientists, if you will, has actually experienced a very similar transformation, uh, similar to what happened in the software world with DevOps. And so these three waves, uh, something to keep in mind is that basically in the past, data analytics in the first wave was expensive. It was only affordable to the large companies, maybe the Fortune 500, uh, the large MNCs, and it was a very significant investment you had to make in the first wave. It was very monolithic, the way things are structured. Uh, in the second wave, what happened was that people decided that they wanted to break it up into specialized tools, but this created a new problem. It meant that people were actually, uh, you know, building things in all these different tools that couldn't talk to each other. So there was a breakdown in communication in the second wave. And basically what's happened with the third wave is that with the emergence of cloud uh, technologies and services, uh, cloud data warehouses, and the way that people are actually able to integrate these different pieces together, in the third wave, this means that people are actually able to uh, experience this integrated, coherent, single source of truth type approach of how you can approach um, data problems. So to visualize that uh, and to make it uh, easy to relate, in that first wave issue, what would happen would be that a person like a data analyst would have to first ask a data engineer to uh, get some help. Like, hey, could you help update the data? Could you help load the things in? Could you uh, basically allow me to do my job? And then you'd have to wait on the engineer to be able to uh, finish that process before the analyst is able to then work on it and then actually be able to provide that to the end user, the business user. And of course, the fact that this problem had so many people in between and everyone has different priorities in their work days, this actually slowed down the speed at which uh, people could get access to data and uh, by extension make decisions. Then the second wave, uh, as I shared, was where they gave everyone tools. Everyone could you know, just be able to access their tools and try to do things themselves. But then this led to a different issue. The issue that then happened was that people were defining things differently. Someone will say, argue that, no, 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 this is um, how we should be thinking about 
uh, our effectiveness of our sales team. And then another team will say, no, no, this is how you should think about it. And you should consider uh, the marketing angles of how much that costs and all. And so this different, uh, this lack of consistent definitions across the company made it very difficult for people to agree. And basically it just results in a status quo of things. And then this third wave is basically what I'll be sharing today about how in this new setup, instead of having people to be the bottleneck, you can have software and data assets to be the middle layer, basically like um, in software where you modularize the issue, you make it such that people can refine uh, that module, refine that piece of software, refine that code, refine that layer so that people are no longer uh, dependent upon a person to be able to get their job done, they can go to this layer to be able to access what they need in terms of data. So what I'm going to share now is a, a very quick overview. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm conscious of the time that we have. But I just want to make sure that everyone has a, a good understanding so that after you leave this talk today, you'll be able to tell other people like, hey, I have a better understanding of, you know, when people talk about data analytics, what's actually going on be, be beneath the hood, how it actually links together. So step one would be the collecting, consolidating and the storing of the data. And like I mentioned about how any app that you're using has a database behind it somewhere. So if you think about, let's say you made an order online uh, and you're on an e-commerce platform, you sign in and you make some purchases. That means that in there somewhere, there's probably a user table, which has the details of all the different users. And there's maybe a products table, which has a list of all the different products that are listed out there. And basically one user can make many purchases. That's a one-to-many relationship between the user table and the product table. And then likewise, there are other pieces of software or maybe like things like Google Analytics, Facebook ads, or other things that uh, are part of the modern business, uh, you know, array of uh, tools. All these things are generating data. So it's important that to be able to work with this, you have to actually consolidate it to be able to make it um, operational, to be able to work with it. And that process is basically the step of taking data, uh, basically extracting it, and loading it into a place, uh, a database or a data warehouse to be able to then allow you to do the different steps you need to be able to produce workable analytics that could be for visualizations or could even be for automation or it could even be for data science. So that steps are basically the overall flow of the process to keep in mind. So uh, like I mentioned about what happens with all these different tools that you use, how do you consolidate that? So, when you think about this, right, it's quite interesting to consider um, that the situation I gave you earlier about um, how there's a database behind every app that you're using, usually those are transactional databases. And that's actually a very different thing from an analytic database. And basically that just means that how you access your data, uh, is, it functions quite differently uh, on how you access and read that data. So on a high level view, um, that database that's sitting behind that app Option one is that you can actually build analytics on top of the, your production database, which we do not recommend. <laughs> you will hear a lot of horror stories about how people decided that they wanted to make it simple and just connect tools to the production database, and they actually crashed the production database, which means that imagine you're trying to use Grab and suddenly the whole thing stops working. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, like that, that could be a horror story of what happens if you did that. So what we would, one of the ways that people approach it is that you could actually do a replica of your production database and then actually uh, connect the tools to be able to work with that replica so it doesn't affect the, the production database. Or uh, it could be that you would actually, uh, for example, there's a very popular technology now called MongoDB, which developers like because it's very easy for them to uh, develop on. And that's an example of a NoSQL type production database. That's something that um, it's not actually very easy to work with a NoSQL database when it comes to analytics. And actually it makes a lot of sense to first load that into a database, a reporting database or a data warehouse before you do your analytics. And so just something to keep in mind about um, what I shared about the old world and the new world in terms of approaching um, analytics. In the past, when you're talking about um, large companies that spent millions on your data warehouses, uh, those were like say your oracles and your different uh, services there, it made sense to actually transform the data before loading it in because you already spent so much on those uh, on that technology uh, and this is actually part of how you can optimize the process. 
But in the new world with cloud data warehouses, like BigQuery, like Redshift, like Snowflake, they've actually improved the technology to the point where it actually makes a lot more sense to load the raw data into the data warehouse and transform it inside the data warehouse. So that simple step of being able to transform data within the data warehouse, instead of having to first transform it, then loading it in, has huge implications on you know, the way you structure your team, the way you set up your processes. And I would argue that in this setup, this is a setup that actually is very data engineering heavy. And this is a very data analyst heavy setup. And in this day and age, computing is cheap, storage is cheap, engineering time is expensive. Ask any startup founder and they'll tell you that one of their biggest problems is hiring engineers. <laughs> so a lot of times, <laughs> I can see new nodding over there. Um, and that's something that if you were to take an engineer away to work on this problem, that's actually not the best use of their time, honestly speaking, because these are problems that have already been solved by existing technologies. So that is something to keep in mind when you're trying to think about how do you want to structure your data team. Uh, and I'll skip through this about the reasons to get a data warehouse because I think I've already kind of covered some of the key principles just earlier. So step two would then be about that processing of the data. And this is something where it gets quite uh, interesting for people to keep, to keep in mind that when people think about um, questions they want to ask of the data, say, for example, I want to ask how many people ordered, uh, how, many, how many women made orders last month uh, that were aged between 20 and 30? Or maybe, uh, you know, tell me what were some of the spikes uh, in my order traffic or web traffic? Those are business questions that we're trying to ask. But the process of going from a business question to be able to match it with the underlying data and the logic that's needed to extract that, that layer is a tricky step that used to be something that people would need to go through a person to do. You would say that, okay, let's say you're the CEO, uh, you decide that uh, as the management, you have certain questions. So you would actually ask your data analyst those questions. Like, uh, can you tell me how many people ordered last week and for, you know, all these different considerations, then they would actually go and write those queries to access it from your database. And that was a process that actually is quite, uh, it, it introduces additional bottlenecks. So keep in mind again, uh, that process I shared with you about um, the steps of how you would load data into a data warehouse and then access that. You can think of it here as these different steps. Uh, there's the loading of the data, there's the transformation and the modeling that takes place. There's the exploration, the presentation, and the delivery or the automation as APIs and all these different steps. These are basically the full uh, steps required in a complete data process. So what happens then is that actually it is possible now to define your business logic in a reusable way. So when I mentioned about how SQL was actually the last language of working with databases. One of the main problems about SQL is that uh, it wasn't quite uh, a fully, this might not be the accurate way of putting it, but it wasn't a fully developed uh, code language in a way that say JavaScript or say Python is. It wasn't easy to modularize SQL. Uh, those standards do not exist. And that meant that a lot of times people would just be copy and pasting queries, editing long running uh, text that basically would just be like a several page long <laughs> query. I've seen some of those before, they are scary. But the problem was that um, they couldn't reuse these uh, queries. They couldn't take out uh, what was being codified. For example, uh, that question where I asked how, how, how many uh, people uh, made a purchase last week. That step is actually something that can be contained in the query and now can actually be modularized. So imagine if you're able to take all the business logic, all the questions you have, and you're able to store it in a reusable layer. That is basically the essence of what data modeling is. And that's going to be something that's going to be more and more important uh, as companies scale, as people start using more data in their operations. That modeling layer is where you basically apply software principles to how you structure your data. So again, um, the example I gave of what happens if you have an analyst in between, they become the bottleneck. Uh, and then you end up in a situation where every top department has their own analyst and they can't keep up with the queries and your, your hiring plans <laughs> start inflating very quickly. Versus in the new setup where basically 
instead of throwing people at the problem, you use a modeling layer to be able to address the issue where you create a reusable component. So now, even with just a single analyst, they can actually start architecting a model that allows you to access your data in a far more effective way. And it doesn't become that, if you thought about the O notation curve, it's not that linear, add one person, additional piece of work is done, set up, but a far more efficient, like every single person can do three pieces of work, five pieces, 10 pieces of work, far more efficiently. So that's actually the key idea behind why data modeling matters in this new world. And basically that transformation step is something that can take place in the data warehouse, something that was only made possible by cloud technologies. Uh, and so that transformation, I won't go into too much detail, but basically it's similar to what I shared about um, how there's a user table and a single user can make uh, many orders so that's what relationship is basically what you call like a one to many relationship between those two tables and think about all the different possible tables that could emerge in a simple piece of application. And that's something that basically a model allows you to capture those relationships, define how they link to each other, update their definitions in a single place rather than in 50, 20 reports of different queries and be able to reuse that uh, as a sort of uh, asset, as a data asset. And so finally for step three about how you actually use the data, which is what most people will be interested in. So really when it comes to using data, uh, that's where you start. Um, again, I'll challenge everyone to think about it, not in terms of the charts, not in terms of the tables, but in terms of what becomes possible uh, once you have well-structured data that everyone trusts, they can even push into other uh, say application. So the, I think the most exciting thing about data is when you're actually creating a reusable layer that people can then architect and build solutions on top of. So that's no longer just about looking at a chart and making a decision. You're able to say push uh, something to say that, okay, if the data spikes across a certain threshold, automatically send out uh, promotions to, to all the people in my database to be able to allow them to, you know, be able to to, to support the growth of your revenue. So that's where your data is actually able to do work for you even while you're sleeping, rather than having to need you to eyeball the data to make the decisions. And that's where um, in this new world, there are actually really different uh, philosophies uh, behind how people have tried to uh, develop an interface to work with this or develop solutions around this. And basically something I wanna challenge everyone to think about as well is that Software is basically an expression of the builder's philosophies on how, how systems should work. So really when you're trying to decide what makes most sense for you, first you have to look at your situation. What do you require? What do you need? But then the next thing you should think about is what are some of the implicit assumptions these different tools and solutions are making and what are some of the consequences in uh, what will happen to my system if I were to introduce such a solution? So again, that's the idea of really, if you were to be able to create a reusable uh, layer, just like in how software systems have been able to turn something that was a siloed problem into a far more elegant uh, solution, I would challenge everyone to think about data in terms of how can you build the most elegant system to be able to allow everyone to have easy access to the data, to be able to create high alignment, high autonomy to how do people can make decisions. And this is just a sort of visualization of how things could work uh, in such a setup. So imagine where you've already defined things like, okay, this is how revenue is calculated. This is how uh, orders is calculated. These are the different fields. And now people can just drag and drop and be able to uh, pull out whatever they require uh, based on their own uh, consideration. So for example, instead of a, a manager having to go to the data analyst to say, can you show me how my revenue is split by cities? Now they can do it themselves here because you've created that asset that allows them to reuse that logic and be able to generate those queries and uh, queries automatically. So ultimately it's about how do you create a setup about how you can work with data most effectively. So I'll just end now on saying that really what we should be thinking about is how can you take ownership of your culture, specifically your decision-making culture in your company. And that really, in my view, 
comes down to how you design, how people can work with data and use data to make better decisions and make that into the norm, make that such that everyone is able to uh, have that access, they're able to think clearly about their problems, they're able to make better decisions, they're aware of the capabilities available to them. And from there, ultimately, you'd be able to uh, set up a goal, uh, goals that everyone's aligned towards and you're able to work in a much more effective way, uh, maybe even with uh, um, fewer people than you would have required originally uh, in the problem. And so, uh, yeah, feel free to ask me any questions based on what you've just heard, what I've just shared. And if you're interested to find out more about um, the topics I've been talking about, feel free to look us up on the different social media channels as well as to access the guidebook that I was just sharing about with the QR code. And I'll hand it back over to Nuno. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, all the participants, please stay with us a little longer. I think there are some interesting questions for Evan here. Um, I just dive into the questions then. So the first one, I guess this is a lot of people who are wanted to be data analysts would be interested. So the question is, what qualities do you look for in a good data analyst? And are there any certification or something that you normally look for? Great question. And something we've observed somehow is that some of the best data analysts actually came from uh, liberal arts backgrounds. <laughs> they were trained in, say, philosophy and history uh, or basically critical thinking skills. So that's actually something that's quite interesting for, from our experience about data analysts is that it's one thing to know how to uh, work, write SQL and work with the technologies, but more important is how they could actually analyze uh, the problem from a system level again and be able to propose solutions uh, to how you can address or approach a problem better. And also um, similar to the iceberg diagram I showed, the best data analysts are the ones that are able to understand the full context of how things link to each other. So uh, always I'll say, if you're asking about technical skills, the top skill is SQL, SQL. Uh, the next would be maybe Python is helpful, but really interestingly and importantly would be actually developing your critical thinking skills, uh, trying to tackle business problems and trying to use data to tackle business problems and work with uh, real data if you can get access to it or if not through coursework uh, online and elsewhere. Mm, thank you. That actually um, brings me to a follow-up question. How important is it that a good data analyst um, have a domain expertise in a certain industry, for example, banking or um, FMCGs and so forth from your experience? Hmm. All right, so this one, I'll probably preface my response based on uh, the kinds of companies we work with and from the sort of, uh, I work with a lot of startups in software and logistics and retail and e-commerce. And what I found is that it seems like these skills are largely transferable and it's actually quite uh, possible for people to work and move across industries uh, at, uh, at the stages that I've been exposed to. Although arguably you could say that um, maybe for certain problem spaces, you might need a lot more deeper expertise. So maybe in those cases, uh, more specialization is needed. But from my experience so far, the, the, the ability to work with the data are very cross industry, very much cross industry. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, what tools do you usually use for ETL or ELT? Uh, for ourselves, we actually use Holistics. <laughs> uh, but there are also others out there, uh, companies like Stitch, uh, Fivetran, Aluma, and I think there are also certain open sourced uh, versions of ETL tools. And even with ETL, there are different um, types. And um, I wouldn't quite call uh, Zapier an ETL tool, but the way it's actually able to push data around different platforms is actually also something to think about in terms of how useful that is for structuring operations and how data works uh, together. So uh, data works very closely hand in hand with operational type processes and actually if you look at tools that operate in that space um, you'll more or less be able to figure out what is useful there thank you so snapcard also used um holistic for etl before <laughs> okay uh next question um i think basically how do you use technology and data to help you with strategic negotiation and decision making Hmm. Uh, do you have experience on this uh, that you could share at noon as well? Because I think uh, Snapcart being in the data space uh, it could be something you'd also have some insights on. Uh, well, I think 
data, like without data, you will never be able to do a proper strategic negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, so everything, so basically um, we collect a lot of data to be able to help brands to make those negotiations basically. So from our specific experience um, in FMCG world, normally consumer goods industry, whether it be P&G, um, L'Oreal and so forth, they never really have access to, to data of consumers. It's always through the retailers themselves. So the one who actually has the power in this industry are the Tesco, the Alpha Mart of the world who actually have mm. the data. So every time when a brand has to negotiate with the retailers for a better shelf space or for pricing, promotions, and so forth, um, they need data. So they would come to us or the likes of market research industry to be able to use those um, to define what are the points that they should negotiate with the retailers. For example, they could say that, hey, our products are selling more in your competitor store. So why don't you store our, more our products and give more presents? So those are the key things that you could use data to tweak and help you with negotiation, uh, depending on the objective you want. So that's, that's from uh, FMCG experience. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic point that just uh, Lim just shared. And I guess what I'll give will be a slightly different perspective from a sort of a builder uh, point of view. So undoubtedly, I think for those sort of negotiations, data will be required to back up um, any claims your people are trying to make. But I think a very interesting place where data is not part, not necessarily a negotiation, but part of an optimization or even an improvement for design purposes is when people are trying to build better products. And a lot of times product managers live and breathe data. They require the inputs about how is my feature being used? Um, you know, how many people logged in? Uh, how long did they uh, interact with that feature and what did they try to do? And those kinds of data uh, inputs become very critical in how you design a better service, how you design a better product. And I think in that sense, it becomes like an internal negotiation where everyone's gathered around about, okay, this is what we're seeing. What does that mean for how we can build a better service? And that's a, that's a view I wanted to share as well about how people look at data uh, when it comes to developing software and products. Thank you, Evan. Uh, the last one that we have from the participants here, uh, do you have a great example of startups that have successfully turned around their business because of their drive to follow data? Hmm, to turn around a business, uh, not off the top of my head about turning around a business. I'll probably have to think a lot harder about that, but I can definitely share that what we have seen is it's an interesting chicken and egg problem where sometimes I feel like when it comes to working with data, a lot of times it has to start with a, a very a strong data champion internally, or it could be the management. Oftentimes it usually comes from the management where they say that we want to use data uh, to make decisions in this uh, company. And then that actually impacts how they set things up, how they design, how they hire. And definitely what we've seen is uh, companies that have built great data uh, great data processes and systems from day one seem to be able to move much faster uh, and grow uh, over time. And we've seen them, uh, some of the customers we first had from young days, uh, they've, they've gone on to raise subsequent uh, rounds of funding and they've grown really well. And those people actually took data very seriously from day one. Uh, so an interesting point that a, a mentor shared uh, with us before was that, um, like data is a necessary condition for a lot of the successful companies that he's seen, like none of the successful startups he's worked with did not have strong data systems in place. Uh, whether it's all that's needed, arguably, no, there are a lot of other things, but the successful ones always had strong data processes and systems in place. Thank you so much. I think uh, if there are no more questions, then this is the end of the um, webinar. And thank you so much, Evan, for spending time and sharing with us extremely, extremely valuable and practical insights on um, the how business uh, nowadays use data to make decisions. Thank My you. Pleasure. It was again. great uh, <laughs> uh, chatting with you as well, Nui. Uh, I was hoping to hear a lot more stories as well, but maybe for another time. Yeah, likewise. likewise. Okay.
Thank you everyone and noon for the lecture as well as interesting discussion regarding data analytics. Hopefully it can be beneficial for everyone. Unfortunately, we have limited time and the time is up for today. But if you have question that has not get answered and you want to connect with Evan and Noor, you can connect with them through LinkedIn. Now I will invite Evan to deliver his closing remarks. <laughs> well, um, just a quick note that um, I think analytics is a, a fascinating space. It's growing and changing so quickly. Uh, so definitely for those of you who are interested, feel free to reach out. I'll be very happy to share more about my experiences. Uh, and yeah, just uh, you know, just just make a start. You don't have to wait uh, till um, you know. It's, it's so possible to learn things uh, online, just over YouTube, uh, over Stack Overflow, and pick things up. So just just uh, start getting your hands dirty, start trying things, start building things, and um, yeah, looking forward to seeing more of you in the industry. <laughs> okay, thank you, Evan. We are so glad to learn about data analytics from you today. And for everyone who wants to know more about our next webinar and community, you can find it on our social media. Furthermore, we are planning to have an online group discussion via Telegram named Insight Community. In Insight Community, we will have weekly discussion with experts through group chat in Telegram covering several topics around business, finance, technology, and marketing. We are open for anyone who is interested in entrepreneurship and want to learn about managing business from the experts. Thank you again for everyone that has joined and stay until the end of the session. And I would like to thank again our speaker, Evan, and our moderator, Noon. Also our partners, 1000 Startup Digital, ICT Ministry of Indonesia, Kumpul, Zilion, and also Taksa. We cannot make this webinar happen without your support. We also really appreciate if you can fill the feedback form from Kumpul, our strategic partner for the purpose of quality improvement in the future. The feedback link is already on the chat box. Before we ended our session, for everyone who wants to be the next founder and build your own startup, please join Gerakan 1000 Startup Digital Initiative by ICT Ministry of Indonesia. The equation is tomorrow. Join and gain insight from top-notch speakers. This program has several stages for you to learn how to build a startup through exclusive workshops. Also, you will get a chance to create your own product in Hacksprint program. Gain feedback from Realable Mentor and get access to an incubation program. For more information, please follow Instagram at 1000 Startup Digital. Okay, I think we arrive at the end of our session. Thank you very much, Evan and Noon, for today's discussion. Hopefully, we can meet again in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope we will see you again in our next webinar.